In the last video, we discovered that the vector d can be expressed by linear combinations of a, b, and c in an infinite number of ways. That led us to our first definition of linear dependence. In this video, our goal is to capture all of those linear combinations by a single mathematical expression. And that will lead us to our second definition of linear dependence, equivalent to the first. Now, it's very convenient to have both because in some cases it's more natural to apply the first definition. In other cases, it's more natural to apply the second definition. All right, so let's accomplish our goal of capturing all the infinitely many linear combinations that yield C, excuse me, that yield D by a single mathematical expression. Now we're almost there because in the last video, we realized that if we take out one A and one B and make up for this by throwing in an extra C, that will leave the value of the expression unchanged. It'll change the expression, but it won't change its value. Its value will still be D. And we're able to do this because C equals A plus B. So taking out one A, one B can be made up for by throwing in an extra C. Or alternatively, throwing in an extra A, 3A, throwing in an extra B plus 2B, and making up for it by taking away 1C minus C would also give us a different expression with the same value. And it doesn't have to be 1 of A and 1 of B or minus 1 of A and minus 1 of B. It can be any amount of A and B and made up for by the corresponding amount of C. So let's call that amount alpha. And that will pretty much answer the question because we realize that here's what we can do. We can take 2 plus alpha A. That's throwing an extra alpha of A into this expression. Plus 1 plus alpha B. I just threw in an alpha of B. Minus alpha C will also equal D. So there you go. That actually satisfies the goal we set out for ourselves for this video. This expression captures the infinitely many combinations of A, B, and C that yield D. And the key to it is, of course, the fact that C can be expressed as a linear combination of A and B. Now what we're going to do is just rewrite this in a way that will prove to be a little bit more insightful. What we're going to do is combine all the terms that have alpha. And here's what we'll have. We'll have 2a plus b, which of course equals d. All right. And now all the terms that have alpha will allow us to factor out alpha. And in parentheses, we have a plus b minus c. Very nice. Okay, and our focus right now will be on this expression right here. Just a different way of writing this. It actually isolates that degree of freedom that we have in the problem. That's one of the advantages of this notation. But let's think for a moment, what does this expression evaluate to? What does this linear combination evaluate to? And of course, the answer is zero. It comes directly from here. As a result of this linear dependence between A, B, and C, the linear combination A plus B minus C equals zero. And whenever we say zero, we mean the zero vector. So we have a linear combination that equals zero. So this linear combination equals zero. So now I'll see what happens. A very interesting thing happens. Because on the one hand, this is adding nothing because we're adding zero. It's not changing the value of the expression. So for any alpha, it's almost like we could skip it because it equals zero. So why write it? Well, there's one important reason to write it. So this term does not alter the value of the expression, but it very much alters the expression itself and leads to there being infinitely many linear combinations that yield D. Because after all, 
this equals this. And here we clearly see the infinitely many linear combinations of A, B, and C that yield D. So don't think of this as a useless zero. Think of it as a very valuable zero. I call it a fancy zero. So adding a fancy zero is very productive in the sense that while it doesn't change the value of the expression, it changes the expression itself. And when it comes to linear systems, our goal will be to capture all possible solution to the linear system. So this way of thinking will prove critical. Now this leads us to the alternative definition of linear dependence. A set of vectors is linearly dependent if there exists a linear combination that equals the zero vector. Now exists is a slightly fancy mathematical word that simply means there is. So a set of vectors is linearly dependent if there is a linear combination that equals zero. You will also notice that I reserved some space for a very important word that should really be in there. As you just heard it, this definition is not quite correct. And it's not equivalent to the original definition of linear dependence that we came up with in the last video. Now we'll fix this problem in the next video, but I would like to end this video by repeating that linear dependence means that there exists a linear combination that equals zero and that immediately implies that there is no uniqueness if you're attempting decomposition with respect to these vectors. Why? Because if there is this linear combination that equals zero, you can throw in as much of it as you want to a linear combination that you found for the vector you're trying to decompose. And by throwing any proportion of this linear combination into the mix, you're not altering the value of the linear combination, but you are altering the appearance of the linear combination. In other words, you're coming up with infinitely many linear combinations that all yield the same vector. So linear dependence immediately applies lack of uniqueness.